Hello, everybody, and welcome to the USA Volleyball Show. We are the official podcast of USA Volleyball. Oh, I don't have my mug. Man, you know, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to, you know, own a mug when you don't drink coffee out of it every morning. You know? Oh, yeah. I can drink other stuff out of it. I can make tea. What's your, yeah, what's your morning drink of choice? Usually, honestly, just. You're going to laugh at me, but it's honestly just, you know, milk? a little hydro. Cookies and milk. No, I'm just kidding. A warm so, glass of milk. No. <laughs> oh, God. My stomach is, yeah, can't handle it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> just, you know, hydro flask of water as I go about you know, in the morning. Yeah. I'll, uh, you know, make some breakfast. Usually have that. You know, if I have either orange juice or apple juice, I sound like a child right now, but if I have like one of the yeah, juices. I'll have a cup of that, but that's about it, you know? If I'm yeah. feeling really, really crazy, you know, I'll probably make some tea, um, but that's not too frequently. It depends on how <clears throat> I'm busy my mornings have been. But yeah, that's it. You know, it's no coffee for me. Yeah. I have to, I don't think I need coffee to like wake up, but it's like, it's so like part of my routine now. And I just love the taste of it. Um, and like the the act of making the coffee is like part of my, like me waking up, you know? It's just part of the routine. Part of the routine. You got to go through the motions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, I think that's my problem. Like, I have it. Like, everyone's like, you have to try the right ones. You know, now some coffee's bad and you're trying this trash stuff over here. And I'm like, well, what's good? Because everything I've tried hasn't been that good. So, I mean, what, what, where do I go? Who do I, who do I trust? For, as, yeah, yeah, for as much coffee as I drink, I'm not like that big of a snob either. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to drink Folgers every morning, but like, you know, it's a camping trip. Maybe I'll, I'll, maybe I'll have some Folgers out there, there but Folger drinking people. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we, we do like the Kirkland brand from Costco, you know, like, and it's good. It's good stuff. Got to work with what's in the budget too, you know. Some of that coffee is very expensive. It is. It is. <laughs> it be me. <laughs> uh, well, that's enough about uh, our breakfast uh, coffee, bev- breakfast beverages of choice. Any coffee but... sponsors out there? We're looking for. It. That's right. Yeah. Any sponsors? Really? We're look- Actually, looking. Actually, for... <laughs> you're right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. But how how was your weekend? How was your weekend? Uh, it was pretty good. What happened this weekend? Oh, the Colorado volleyball, uh, high school volleyball state, uh, state finals championships. Uh, we're happy nice. uh, happening on Saturday. So me and a few, um, uh, friends and coaches went up there to see a few of the matches. Um, some really good schools, man. I think Valor Christian took the five egg championship. Um, Palmer Ridge took four A. So congratulations oh, to four A. Yeah. Um, we have a colleague, um, Rylan Underwood, uh, who works in our membership department for USA Volleyball. He's an assistant coach on that staff. So congratulations awesome. to your team, Rylan. And then three uh, A and below. Um, <clears throat> I can't remember word for word um, which team um, won it all too, but there are some really, really good matches there. I'm just like, wow, you guys. Like I, I, it's insane. Like that level of volleyball, that love, that atmosphere is insane as well. Too, that was my first time like experiencing what state, what what the what what the oh, yeah. stuttering <laughs> what state looks like. But it's it, it was yeah. really great to see for sure. A little slice of uh, volley palooza. Well, volley palooza, just five <laughs> courts, but it was it was definitely volley palooza for sure. You can see a lot of sets went five, and teams were just gassed, but they just kept pushing through, and it was a lot. of a lot of good play. Some really, really, really nice. great talent out there too. So um if you're in Colorado and you just participated in the state or you know people who just participated in the state, big congratulations to all the teams that had the opportunity to compete and big congratulations to all the teams that won their divisions uh in state. But yeah. How was your weekend? What did you do? Oh, uh it was very low key. I took Friday off uh mm-hmm. and just uh Hung out with the family around the house. Yeah, it was great. Um, didn't really do much. I'm like trying to remember. Did we? Did we do anything crazy? I don't think so. We just don't like you uh, love that when it's yeah. so low key. <laughs> she would just forget what happened. You're just like, yeah, it was just great. So it was just great. We caught up on some shows. We uh, we took some walks around the neighborhood. Okay. I actually uh, put together our uh, our hall tree 
uh, ordered it like a month ago, finally put it together. So that was a big <laughs> win for me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I feel like I'm like that stereotypical dad now where like, you know, I can fix it or I can put it together by myself, uh, when, when, but, it, when's it, when's but it's such a long game? project, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, low key, low key weekend. So it was, it was great and weather was great. So we got outside a little bit, which, which was nice. And yeah, just, just really great this weekend yeah. from like snowing randomly to really, really great weather. So yeah, it did snow. Yeah. Uh, where were you? I would say like a week and a half it did or something like that. Maybe. Oh yes. Yeah. 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 I thought you meant this weekend. I was like, oh no, no, I missed that. <laughs> no, they did this. Yeah. Uh, oh my gosh. We have a, an awesome episode for you guys today and it's, it's a doozy. It's a long one, but it's so, so good. Like literally every minute of it is so good. So we're going to get into it right now, but before we do, if you haven't listened or watched our last episode, check it out right now. Right after you finish this one, University of Texas Volleyball and U.S. Women's National Team middle blocker Asia O'Neill shares her background. She talks about her journey through two heart surgeries, reflects on her experience with the national team this summer, and of course, looks back at winning the NCAA championship with Texas last year. All that and more in episode 77. Listen now wherever you get podcasts or watch on the USA Volleyball website or YouTube channel. And mentioning all that, congratulations to Asia, who just overtook someone she looks up to. That's right, Chiaka Obogu, who she mentions in that episode. Uh, they grew up in Dallas together uh, and then, uh, of course, played with each other, teammates at Texas. Uh, but she just overtook her school record for most blocks in school history at Texas. So Chiaka has 537 blocks and now... Uh, Asia has 538 and counting because we still got a few games left in the season. Uh, so congratulations to Asia. And uh, I'm sure that means a lot to her uh, as she, you know, took the record from someone that she looked up to growing up in Dallas and of course, uh, Texas. And now with the national team too. Really cool moment for them. But let's keep things moving with news with Hughes. Congratulations to Andy Benish and Miles Partain and Therese Cannon and former podcast Megan Kraft for winning the Darsaka playoff in Manhattan Beach over the weekend. Uh, this was a playoff to earn a spot in the final two Norseka events where teams can earn Olympic qualifying points. Big points on the line as they move closer to Tokyo. Ooh. Oof, would I just say Tokyo? Excuse me. As they move closer to Harris. Excuse me, Paris, 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 24. There we go, you guys. Uh, congratulations to Chase Budinger and Miles Evans for winning gold at the BPT Challenge Heiko. And then congratulations to former guest Trevor Crab and Theo Brunner for winning silver at the same event. Um, Chase and Miles actually beat Trevor and Theo 2 <clears> 0. <throat> the U21 World Championship concluded, concluded yesterday. Um, Samaya Mori. And Taylor Wilson and Thomas Hurst and Gage Basie both finished tied for ninth after losing in the round of 16. Sarah Sponsel, The Love of Kenya is out right now. This feature goes through Sarah's experience traveling to Kenya after meeting the Kenyan national team at the Olympic Games in Tokyo. Um, she also partners with them um, in World Concern to provide humanitarian aid and beach volleyball equipment to the youth impoverished in uh, the youth in impoverished areas. Excuse me. Uh, watch it now on the USA Volleyball website or on YouTube. The men's and women's national teams are getting settled with their pro teams overseas. Um, be sure to check out the weekly updates on USA Volleyball website, um, and also stay in the know for all things going on in their pro club seasons. We're almost getting through this, you guys. A lot of news with you today. Congratulations to former pod guest Morgan Hintz on a successful season with Athletes Unlimited, earning Defensive Player of the Year honors. Shout out to all of the award winners and to Athletes Unlimited for another successful season in season number three. Follow along the action on USA Volleyball social medias and for more on all the latest news, you know where to visit, usavolleyball.org. Now on to today's show, buckle up, because I had to 
looked down because I thought my mic was muted. <laughs> <laughs> Buckle up because we have an awesome show for you featuring U.S. men's national team middle blocker Taylor Avril. Taylor takes us through his background in volleyball, talks about his podcast, The Tallest Podcast on Earth, reflects on his summer with USA and helping earn the U.S. a berth to the Paris 2024 Olympic Games. He also goes into what he's doing now to give back to the sport and so much more. Listen to that right now uh, coming up in our conversation with Taylor. Here it is. Steven Mustache Munson. You forgot that. So, yeah, I had to, a little precursor here. I had to, I w- I've been growing a nice little beard. Um, and I had to what a shave luxury, down yeah. a stash. I had to shave down a stash because we got, we have the stash on the podcast today. <laughs> Dude, I wish this was something I had to do, but this is all that I have. Like, I don't know <laughs> what, you know? <laughs> So, okay. <laughs> the, try, I'm, yeah, it's, it's yeah that's nice, that dude. Yeah, I love when I, I I say that to people all all the time. Like, this is all I can grow because I can't really grow a beard at all. And then guys like you who can grow full beards are like, yeah, you know, this is like, just like trying to like fit in with me. It's okay, dude. You, you got a nice beard. I can see it from here. You don't have to make me feel better. It's a nice one. I I have to. I have an awkward stage in the middle of growing a beard where, like, right here, it's just like bare until it gets long enough to where it can go, and it's just there. That it's not even like symmetrical on the other side. It's just it's just right here on the side. Dude, if I would at least take like some sexy stubble, you know, something, <laughs> just like a little something, but it's just gross, dude. It's like long and spotted. It's not a good idea. I love well the stash looks great and it goes great with the long hair too. I'm in a I'm in a I need to cut mine down. It's it's a little long here. I need to yeah. cut it. Yours is like you the lottery, or... I think. Skeeter brain. Get those cornrows going. Also, are we are we recording right now or no? We are. Yeah. Okay, sweet. Sorry, I wasn't sure. Because I will say when I, when we were at uh Olympic qualifiers in Japan, everyone was getting haircuts. And it was like a couple guys, Thomas Jeske and Aaron Russell shaved their heads and it was like let's all as a team shave our heads and look at i've had long hair most of my life or like medium <laughs> long hair like most of my life and shaving my head is something that like i've always wanted to do i know i don't have the head for it but i've always wanted to do it but it's just such a commitment you know then you have to do like another two years probably to get it back to this length yeah, that kind of time, dude. I don't have that kind of self of confidence to go that low. <laughs> try to work my way back up. I was. But everyone. I'm glad you brought that up. up. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I was. I wasn't sure if that was an, if that was like a new thing, but it was a team thing that you're gonna. And but I only saw Thomas and Aaron shave their heads, right? Yeah, they. Those they were the only two ones who had the the guts, dude. Yeah, I thought I thought they might be channeling some like oh eight. Like Beijing games, like Read Pretty, Clay Stanley vibes or something. They but. also look like I'll give it to them. Both of them looked sick. Like it was a vibe for both. Oh, yeah, in my opinion. Like I thought it was yeah. so tight. And I've always wanted to be the guy who can pull that off. But I feel like I have like pretty Rocky Mountain shoulders with this like tiny little snowball of a head. So I was just like, I don't think that's gonna be a good vibe <laughs> for me, dude. I'm like kind of losing my hair too a little bit. Like slowly. I hate saying that. I was I just about to bring that up. Like, yep. I'm getting that he's losing losing his hair? It's thinning a little bit, dude, and I'm just like, God, I gotta, I gotta no. keep this as long as long as it yours right looks now. good. Yours is staying strong. I have my my hairline's receding bad, and I know I'm gonna have to shave my hair very soon. <laughs> but you look like you have an. I'm nice holding on as long as I can. Head. Yeah, I think you're gonna do well <laughs> with a shaved head. I'm gonna <laughs> jinx myself and say I think I'm okay. <laughs> But who knows? A week from now, I might be like, "Oh, good, Clay. Oh, dang, you're, good. you're still young too. You got that young blood." <laughs> Wait, how how old are you guys? I'm a. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Steve. I had to do the math for a second. I'm 33. <laughs> is that right? 33. Yeah, 33. yeah, that's right. Are you yeah. asking me? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, both. Yeah, you know, I don't know how, how old are you guys. I'm uh, I'm 28. Ooh, little, little dog action in the okay. background. I saw that. Looks like she's up on the couch. Look at her. She's like, <laughs> "What's going on, dude?" What's going on, dude? No pee on how, old are you, how old are you, Taylor? I should on 31. Know. 31. Okay, cool. All right. So we're all we're all kind of right there. So we're kind of right, right in that zone, dude. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Well, thank you. Hey, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and talk with us. We we were joking before that we had a you know a list of, list of questions, a script that we we're gonna follow, but we're it's gonna go off the cuff. We're going way off topic. You already know because you're such an interesting guy. Great conversations. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm just let's just jump right into it. You mentioned um, uh, Thomas and Aaron, and you know the great summer that USA had. You know, qualifying for the Olympics. Congratulations on that as well. Um. But just kind of a fun question here, and I think, I don't know, I think you're the perfect person for this, but, you know, out of the U.S. men's squad, build your perfect volleyball player, you know, from the, you know, characteristics, attributes from, from the squad um, that you train with. Mm. Well, I definitely won't be involved in any of it, so let's start with that. Obviously, <laughs> okay, facial hair. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, maybe the flow. Um, um, yeah. Can I use like pre? I would use uh yeah, 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 yeah. On through the program. Yes. So no, for me, without a doubt, I would take like the smoothness of Taylor Sander. He is okay. like yeah. for sure my favorite guy to watch play. It like looks like he's playing kind of in slow motion. Um, and it's actually a quality that right now I'm like trying to train more. I think a lot of times as middles we get we're like the tall dorky dudes who are just like, you know, we're really stiff and we kind of have to be in certain areas of our role on the team. Mm -hmm. And so I think like the quality of smoothness makes it feel more like artful and like beautiful. And I think that that's like an underrated concept to work on. Um, so I'm, I'm very taking Taylor standard. Court, yeah. Dude, he's, he's without a doubt. was. I see that a lot in like TJ's, TJ's play too. Like a little yeah. bit of, of Taylor Sander, just the way he like floats and looks effortless on the court, like flying around on the court too. Yeah, it's pretty tight, dude. So um, I'm like all about <laughs> movement, dude. And I think these guys are great examples. TJ's definitely a really good example too. Like his arm swing, like his approach, like it's so quick and then explosive and he hangs and just like, follows through really well on the ball and it just looks nice dude so i take his smoothness um and probably like most other attributes as, as an athlete <laughs> um, i would take the hey don't there touch that that's gonna happen you guys we got there buddy we go. here don't do it six months long haired dachshund terrorizing the house and i thought i'd <laughs> uh, eat for out while we did this so um and then i would take uh micah ma'a's attitude oh yeah how okay. i just did a podcast with him not too long ago um to plug my own stuff here tallest podcast on earth please um, do um and we we did one and i just like i've loved that guy for so long he's just one of those people that you really want to compete with um and he happens to be a setter which i think if you're going to be a setter you need to it's a good quality to have um just to be like really positive and like he kind of always takes the fault for things too a little bit um, when they're not always his fault. And I think he makes players feel good and comfortable and gets the best out of them. And he's just a fun dude. Like that's the thing, the qualities that at least to me, I'm attracted to in like learning and growing from other players is like, dang, they just look like they're having so much fun and they're getting better. And uh, I also think that's like a pretty underrated, um, skill for coaches to teach as well. Like you know, so many kids want to play professionally or want to go to college and play and want to do these things. And they think it's the, like what we see on social media, a lot of the like, wake up at five and nice bath and get into the sun and then go to, and all those things are great, you know, but like, don't forget not to take yourself too seriously along the way. And I think that's when the magic happens, you know? Um, so he's a great example for me. I love him dearly. Those two players, I think cover a lot, honestly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other than maybe like maybe like David Smith's read blocking, I would say okay, like just yeah. reading and analyzing of the game. I mean, he's been around the longest. Was an incredible read blocker. I would say to that point, David Lee's actual blocking. That guy was like an animal. He was also so monster. Like, yeah. yeah, and he was like kind of undersized, not the best jumper, and had an insanely successful career because he just was so good at positioning himself in great spots and anticipating really be well in good situations and he's a legend too i love that i got i mean so much more out of that than i thought i was gonna get that was awesome thank you so much <laughs> mm -hmm. that was cool uh i i feel like we've 
you you've shared your your background a lot on your podcast and thank you so much for plugging that uh tallest podcast on earth and sorry to bring down the average height of the podcast uh I, i'm only five nine so uh <laughs> i saw i i watched the the chess one that you had with jake and max and i was like that's the tallest. that's the tallest podcast episode for sure <laughs> that has to be like in combined height the tallest podcast ever recorded yeah by three for years. sure you gotta we got to get that be your record. That. Yep. <laughs> um, but yeah, kind of like take us through your introduction to volleyball. I think you started a little bit later, uh, if I if I remember correctly. But yeah, take us through kind of your introduction into volleyball. Oh, uh, well, I played soccer my whole life. I thought soccer was going to be my sport. Um, soccer and basketball as a kid, and then soccer more so into up until middle school. And then I had a bit of a rebellious phase in middle school and uh, yeah, just decided I didn't want to do competitive sports because I felt like it brought out a side of me that I didn't like. Like I, by nature, and most of us on the national team are very competitive, which is why we're able to succeed, I think, at a high level where you need to be competitive. Um, but at that age, I reached a point where I was like, I am not happy with like the person I am when I'm like this competitive. I'm like taking myself and things way too serious. So I stopped and I started skateboarding and I was like, I'm going to be a pro skater. So I'm just, just going to skate. And I have my friends and we did that for a while. Um, and then freshman year of high school rolls around and I have like an insane growth spurt. I go from like, I actually graduated middle school at five, nine and then had like a wild, like five, nine, like a hundred pounds. I was just a small skinny stick, like an average stick. Um, and then went to a doctor and they're like, you need to put some weight on. So I actually, that was the first time I got into kind of fitness for the first, first time, which is now a huge part of like what I do and what I'm really into. Um, and went to the, down to the local library and got some books and like read up on it, gained 50 pounds, literally that summer going into freshman high school, freshman high school, gained 50 pounds, freshman year starts. I gained three inches in like two months, like just start growing and got shin splints was like, I can't run anymore. I can't do soccer. And uh, I was like, all right, what's the sport for like a guy, like a tall, dorky guy who's like not athletic enough to like really succeed in basketball, but like wants to do something. And that's where volleyball came in for me. Hmm. And then in fact, when I first started, they called me the credit card because the the joke was that you couldn't put a credit card under my critical. <laughs> Kids called me credit card. And I, I started in the middle, dude, just like as a tall, oh, dorky yeah. middle, you know, and uh I was lucky that I just fell in love like so fast. And the head coach, his name is Ryan Georges. Shout out to him. I'm um, kind of boosted and got me started in my career, paid for my first club season ever because our family couldn't afford it at the time. Like he just saw how much I loved it and how dedicated I was. And it's not even something that I was like, I want to be pro. It was just like, this is all I want to do. Like all I wanted to do was play volleyball. I would play grass, sand, like indoor, open gyms at local community centers where there was like, 13 year old girls and 65 year old men and they would just go one two three four five six team one two three four five six like dude i just loved i could not get enough of it um so i was lucky because i think a lot of times at least now as an adult like the idea of starting something completely new sounds like terrifying like sucking at something now is like you know hard to do it's hard to suck you know um and i was lucky enough that i just didn't care because i just loved it so much so that led me into playing every day, playing at Beta Bay, um, was it outside in high school, was it opposite and setter uh, as club season rolled around and then got recruited by John Sparrow to go to UC Irvine uh, to play Division One. And uh, I don't know if you guys want me to continue or not. <laughs> okay, you can keep going. I did want to ask, like, what was that hook factor that like, you talked about, like, uh, you know, kind of just coming to the jam and they threw it middle, you know, credit card league, got that nickname and everything too. But then... Um, Talk about like what made, what about the game made you fall in love with it? What made you just, this is it for, for forever, as long as you can. That's a really good question. <clears throat> it's a good question because it's like, I didn't have the natural attributes of like, oh, you could be good at this. Like, I, it's not like I was insanely tall when I first started. It's not like uh, I was this amazing jumper athlete where someone's like, yo, you have what it takes. Dude, I don't even know. I just loved it. Like, I really don't know. I just really loved it. And I will say the community I had around it my freshman year 
was like a group of my friends who also didn't play volleyball. Like maybe they played in middle school, but like no one was like volleyball players in quotes, you know, like everyone, mm -hmm. my friends. And in fact, my freshman year, that team stayed together until my senior year and we won CCS, which was the first time a public school, Brandon High School had ever won a CCS title for anything. So that was a big deal. And um, I think it really goes to show like, if you have a supportive community, if you can find community in the things you're doing, it just keeps pushing you to want to pursue the thing you love. And where I've had lots of times in my career where I've been on my own, and now I have luckily the self-motivation to continue. And I, I loved getting that time to myself. Even as an adult, now I realize like, dude, you just can't do it on your own. You need other people friends who ever like knock on your neighbor's door like figure out someone who loves to play like my joke is like my dad was a uh, did triathlons and like you know but never really volleyball but he would pepper with me in front of the house my roof was my pepper partner for three years like i we had an eight foot tall roof that kind of slanted i would set the ball on there and then like bump it on there and then close my eyes and turn around and try to defend a ball or like dude there, there were so many different things we did just to like find ways to keep volleyball fun and fresh and play and touch the ball as much as possible. And when you have a community around you that supports that and you have opportunity to play, um, it really pushed me to continue. Yeah. I've been loving the videos you've been sharing on social, uh, with you and your dad, uh, in the gym, yeah. uh, peppering and shooting hoops and stuff. That's so fun. That was actually like a pretty special moment, you know, with, with the lifestyle that I've lived the past, really since I went to college, um, being gone for Christmas, being gone most of the year, and then I come back and they're in San Jose in Northern California and I'm down here in LA. We just don't get to see each other that often, let alone like play volleyball or do anything. Like oftentimes I'm training so much, I'm like, I'm not trying to like play volleyball in my spare time anymore, you know? Like I, that's what I do for a living. Uh, so. You know, I'm in this really unique situation right now where like I need to be training and find unique ways to train. It's almost actually it like brought me back to when I first started playing where it's like I wake up and I'm like, all right, I got to find a gym. I got to find people who like volleyball around me. And it's tough in this area specifically right now. But I'm, I'm finding it, you know, like I'm finding people who are down to play and like found a gym um, to train at. And like, so it was cool. My dad came to visit uh, for four, four or five days. Um, and it was just fun to like, I was like, dude, I actually need someone like, will you come help me? And he's also, he played basketball in college. He loves basketball. Um, so yeah, we were like playing basketball and I never get to play basketball. So I was like, damn, I can dunk. This is tight. <laughs> and it's like, how can I find a way to like train volleyball, but play basketball? And, you know, as I get older, you know, I've been doing working out and like playing volleyball for so long, finding ways to train that get me excited is uh super important to me because i'm someone who really loves novelty and loves exploring and i'm very curious by nature and so finding unique ways to train um is something that i'm really into and it's like fun for me now to be in a position where it's like here you go here's your test like you got to stay in shape because at any point here you could go overseas so you know um find a way and so it's really challenging for me at this point mm. i love the uh just the conversation that you started around community and finding it and like you know it doesn't it doesn't disappear no matter where you go to and it's very vital right so can you talk about your your journey or your experience finding that community with your college team you know where that started out there yeah i will say like college is the easiest to find community like unlike not everyone goes to college just for sports you know I did. I majored in sociology and minored in women's studies. You know what I mean? Like I went to college for volleyball. Okay. And so like, uh, I, I think that's, those were such amazing times because you're so young and like so malleable. You have so much to learn. There's so much going on. You're in a place where everyone's your age and you're on a team where everyone wants to do the same thing as you. Like you're with 20 guys who also want to play volleyball every day. Like it's the best. So that was a lot easier. Um, and you know, just to give you people maybe who don't know, like a small bit of like my story in college, I'll try to keep it like pretty short. I got recruited to go play uh, UC Irvine by John Spraw, who's the head coach of the national team. And within two months, I was let go from the team for drugs and for being kind of a party kid. And 
that was the first time volleyball was taken away from me. And so I could still go to school, but I was done with the team. I was not a part of the team anymore. And so again, you talk about community. Like I was like, well, at first I was like, all right, maybe I'll do something else. Maybe this is a sign that life is saying like, go, this is not your calling. So I took that kind of to heart and was like, all right, let's see what, let's start getting into music and other things for like a couple of weeks. And after a couple of weeks, I was like itching. It's like, no, my body, me, I love this sport still. Like this is not the end for me. And I actually found a community of people out there um, who also played volleyball. I was living in Newport Beach. Like that's a great place to find volleyball friends and did and played beach every day and was still playing every day and got a call from Charlie Wade at University of Hawaii and was like, hey, we know about your situation. Um, we're here to give you a second chance. And so I got called over to University of Hawaii for that next year. And technically I was red shirting, so I didn't have to lose a year in transferring, which was nice. Go to Hawaii my first year. Um, I already had kind of the spotlight on my back of being like the party outgoing kind of kid. And um, I've always had a problem with just like blanket authority. So I had so many lessons to learn, you know, and with a coach that like I butted heads with, you know, I butted heads with Charlie for um, by that first year a lot where it was like the example I give is he'd be like, hey, we want you to static block. And I was training as a setter opposite that year. And I was like, why? Like, I need to swing block. I'm not a natural jumper. Like, why would I do that? Why would I do that? And like kept butting heads. And um, by the end of that year, uh, pretty similar situations. I thought, well, I'll have my second chance, but I can have my cake and eat it too. And uh, by the end of that year, I had shoulder surgery. I'd torn my labrum. I had a slap tear. And so I was recovering that summer. And uh, by the end of that summer, coming into the year, I played a practical joke that the coaches did not think was funny. And they were like, you are indefinitely suspended. We're done with you. They were like, you can use the facilities to train and stay in shape, but like you're not on the team anymore. And I remember uh, being at Blazing Stakes near campus with my assistant coach, his name's Jeff Hall, talking about what are my options. And because I was traded already, I couldn't go play Division One anymore in the States. And we were talk talking about McMaster in Canada. And I just started crying, dude. I was like, no way this is really happening. Like, you don't go from Hawaii to Canada. If anything, you go Canada to Hawaii. That makes more sense. But you don't go from being in one program, getting let go, being in another program, being let go, and then going to Canada. Like, I just lost it. And I was like, I have to find a way again. The thing I loved the most was taken away from me. And I was like, no way I have to find a way. And in that six months, so that kind of happened in like early summer, the season starts in January. Within that time I had, I worked out on like another level. I met a guy named Daniel Marchong shout out. He like saved my career. He's in Hawaii. You can check him out at Mar training on Instagram, very unique style of training. And he took me under his wing and we worked every day on my shoulder rehab, on general fitness, like still jumping, like still doing all these things. And December rolls around. I was kind of like the baby fat kid, like not super good in shape, but just like, I like working out, but like no big deal. I lost 20 pounds. I put 11 inches on my vertical as I was recovering from shoulder surgery and was in incredible shape. And, and the way the campus works the coach's offices overlooked the football field. And every single day I made sure to do some version of sprinting plyometric training in front of their windows. So they saw me training every single day. And after six months, January rolls around, the team had signed a petition to bring me back on the team. And the coach said, you know what? Here's the deal. We see you working. Here are the rules. You need to get straight A's for the rest of the semester because that's what I did that semester I got straight A's was in incredible shape and was like please give me a third chance and they said here's the conditions we're going to bring you back on the team you need to get good grades no more slipping up I don't want to hear any like I was on the last straw and then they said uh our team needs a middle this year so if you want to play you need to be a middle and I said I will do anything i'll be the water boy like just please and i've been stuck in the middle ever since <laughs> so that's like more or less my my story i was fell in love with fitness and things that were good for me and i got really addicted to healthy things like sleeping good and eating good and 
at that age too, you see the results of those things so quickly. Um, I was training like a wild man, like looking back on it, I was overtraining for sure. But at that time, like your body can adapt. I was surfing every day. I was training two and a half hours with Daniel Marr and then uh, three times a week with the team um, just in the training facility. Like I was in the best shape of my life. It let me back on the team. And uh, my last two years, I was a first team All-American and got asked my last senior year as I graduated to play on the national team from the coach who kicked me off you know, six years, five years prior. So it's pretty special. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. I know you, you've shared it before. I think you even did a takeover, uh, on our Instagram account and, and shared a little bit of that story too, a while back, but, um, yeah, go like fast forward to where you just left off. What were those conversations like with John, uh, as he was, you know, talking about bringing you onto the national team? It's pretty incredible. The relationship I have now with John seeing as like I was the guy he used as an example when he went to UCLA when he like you know being like you don't want to be like this guy because look what happened to him and now he's you know and then slowly I was able to change that narrative and now it's like you know something that I, I think is like so beautiful that he calls me to go train with the national team and he's just like people can change you know and uh I did I was able to do that I'm not perfect you know um, there, that boy still lives inside of me, you know, and we have learned to manage him for sure. Um, but I feel so blessed that I was able to get that opportunity after everything that had happened early in my college career. Um, and so many people along the way helped. We talked earlier about community. Like I just had a couple other guys who like also were let go from the team that first year who also were down to train and get in good shape. And they weren't, they weren't able to make it back on the team, but, um, you know, I, I met the right people at the right time. Milan Zarkovich, the assistant coach there, talk about falling in love with volleyball. Like there were so many games he played. His style of training was so different. Like I just was so, so lucky mm -hmm. to get to play a successful Division One career after everything that had happened. So, you know, it's funny now. I tell John literally to this day, when I see a call, like if he called me right now, I'm, my heart drops every time. Cause I'm like, yeah. oh my God, I'm in trouble. What'd I do? what I do? And I have to like replay, like, did I do anything wrong? Anything bad? Like, dude, I freak, I freak out. Like to this day, it's like some deep trauma <laughs> I have with it. And he just, we just laugh about it. Now, you know? <laughs> yeah, that, that is a beautiful journey and, and, uh, of kind of full circle moment there. Uh, and obviously having a great career now still with the national team Were there, you mentioned like health and, um, some of the training you did. And I imagine, you know, those are lessons that you learned in that, through that journey. But is there anything else that you've kind of carried with you from that journey that you, that you still hold with you as you, um, continue with your professional career? <laughs> I learned how to talk to coaches. I learned how to voice my opinion in a healthy way. Um, I learned how to manage my emotions in a healthy way. And that's not easy to do. It's easier to be pissed and act pissed and everyone knows you're pissed. You know, like that's easy to do. Yeah. It's easy to get blocked and pout. It's easy to have an amazing game and think you're God's gift to volleyball. Like that stuff's so easy to do. <sighs> and I was very humbled very early. And I think that allowed me to develop into like the man I am today and the player I am today. And I'm still not perfect. Like to be clear, it's still something I struggle with. Um, but it's something that I'm conscious of and that I'm consciously working on. Um, so I think being able to find a way to, uh, communicate that to a coach or another player in like a healthy way and be vulnerable. I think a lot of players are scared to voice their opinion. And for example, when you go overseas, it's even worse. Like I've had a lot of coaches overseas who were sad to say dead average and uh the practices were the same thing kind of boring and it's the same i get back to the locker room everyone's talking smack on how you know this coach is so boring this drill sucks like just complaining complaining and i'm over here like let's change it like let's find a way to get guys excited to be here because in my opinion that's sustaining if you can get players to want to show up like be excited to come to training you've already won it doesn't matter so much what you do it really doesn't you're giving them things that get them excited to play the game you've won 
And uh, every team I've been on, I end up being like the mediator between the coach and the players. Because overseas, a lot of like European guys, like they're not going to be the ones, they live in a different culture. They're not going to be like, hey, coach, uh, what do you think about this drill? Or like, hey, coach, guys are like kind of complaining and like, can we find a solution? You know, like maybe we can make something more of a game or like maybe we can keep score for this drill or whatever it is, you know? And I'm always that guy now because I learned early how to communicate my feelings and problems. And the only way I learned it is by doing it, uh, I hate to say incorrectly, but like, you know, in a, in a in a manner that's not healthy and not necessary out of practice to stop practice and be like, coach, I hate this. Or like, hey, coach, like, why are we doing this? You know, that's not the time to do it. Um, and I, I learned that early and that's carried me through my career. And I feel like now really blessed to be able to share and mediate in a way to create an environment that I'm excited to be in and that I think supports the team's goals more, you know? I love that. Yeah. yeah. yeah I think that makes like a ton of sense too. I mean, I, I, I coach at the high school and only club level and, and you know, we go over like, you know, little items on how to talk to college coaches, how to, you know, communicate. But then, you know, once you're there, once you're experiencing it, it's a whole nother level of, you know, consistent communication with you're talking about practices or whatever. But I mean, that's a really good just trait to carry with you like throughout, you know, no matter what, you know, part of life you're in. Or would you say that like is your I don't want to say your your biggest takeaway, you know, from that uh, experience uh, in college, but is it one of the more notable ones for sure? I think it's something that came to my mind when you first asked me for sure. Um, I would say the biggest lessons I learned from that experience. Um, I get I get asked this question a handful and there's so many different ways to go because I mean it was just like such a huge moment in my life like mm -hmm. such a life-changing experience and so there's tons of things <laughs> I learned I was 19 you know like I was a baby I had so much to right. learn um but I will say it reaffirmed uh my love for what I do and you know we talk about as you get older volleyball becomes more of a job it can feel like more of a job some days. And to me, when it starts to feel like a job, uh, whether it's because I have a coach who we're doing the same practice every day or the same thing, and it's kind of boring and guys are complaining and it's just like normal season stuff. And I get kind of burned out where I'm like, I've been doing the same kind of workouts forever. I've been playing volleyball and doing hitting lines since I was 15. Like, this isn't exciting to me. I find ways to take control of that rather than just let it overtake me and now be a part of uh, the group who just wants to complain about things. Like like I said earlier, like that's really easy to do. And to that point, it's hard to have the self-awareness and self-control to be like, all right, what can I do to make this exciting? And again, and to keep like doing all these callbacks, like having community helps. So like a lot of times when I go on a team overseas, there's usually one guy who's like on the same page as me who like also wants to have fun and wants to get better. And uh, like one example, Canadian libero named Blair Band, we played together in France. We called ourselves the greasy grinders. And like a lot of the French dudes on that team were like kind of complaining all the time. And like the practices were super boring. We had an ancient coach, a legend, but like just boring. And so like we found ways to make things fun. When we played baggeroni or volley tennis, um, like we were super competitive, you know, like we had a blast and off the court, like, we hung out and just had a good time. So like even that one person changed my entire experience. For those of you who don't know, I played in France in Chamont. Chamont is like a village in the middle of nowhere in France with 12,000 people in this tiny village. It's raining all the time. It's a dark place. And I'm happy I'm not there currently. Okay. <laughs> but like it, that I was like super testing and a lot of Poland was similar, really dark and cloudy. And like, I'm a California kid. I love to surf. Like, that's hard, you know? So like learning how to find other outlets to keep myself excited and explore and kind of maintain that kind of beginner's mindset gets very, very challenging as you get really good at something. But it's such a great reminder for me of like, I'm no different than the kid who's first started playing. You know, it's like things got easier. I got better. I got confirmation from people. You're so good. Look, and now you're on the national team and now you're playing in these best leagues and you got best middle blocker in the league and like all these things and uh it doesn't take away from the fact that like i need to have fun i'm still a kid 
And I'm so blessed that I'm 31 years old. And like that kid has not been lost through like spit out through like the wheels, not to get like crazy philosophical here, but like through society, you know, that I'm able to like maintain that kid and realize that like, I don't have to be ashamed of that, that I don't have to like buy into this. Like you just got to show up and work hard and I'm the coach, do what you say, like, or do what I say. Like, you know, that there's a, there's a happy medium in there. And I think that was my biggest lesson to finally answer your question uh, of my college experience is like, find your balance in all of this. Mm -hmm. Find your balance between wanting to go out and party and have fun and also get a good night's sleep and do these other things. And like, like I said, I got addicted to doing the healthier things after I was the party boy because I was like, dang, when I sleep good, I feel better. Dang, when I eat healthy, I feel better and I'm able to work out longer. And now I'm seeing a two, four, six abs. Like I, I was shredded. I was skinny, but I was shredded in college. Like I worked so hard for it. And I'm so proud of myself for showing up and like finding a way. And that looks so different for everyone. And finding balance at that age can be really difficult. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting lost now. So yeah, that's why no, I, I, I love you. that so much. There, mm -hmm. there are so many good pieces in that. I think it transitions perfectly into uh, what I want to talk about next. But you know, you, you mentioned finding that balance and continuing to find that love for the game and challenging yourself in new ways, curiosity. Um, but uh, your your brand, you won't. Uh, does that kind of all fall into to why you started that? And and what is you won't uh, exactly? <laughs> you won't is my dream brand, let's say. Um, and as I get older and start pursuing other ventures and other avenues of ways to fill my time um, and give back to the volleyball community, which is kind of where I've been for the last couple of years is um, let's create let's create community. You know, I was lucky enough to be raised by volleyball community and it gave me so much experience and opportunity in life. Like, let's give back a little bit. So that's what I shared through, you know, created the Middle Blocker Academy, um, shared through my Instagram, like podcasts, like how can I find ways to get kids hyped on the thing that like gave me, you know, so much in life. Um, and so you won't was originally. So when I got kicked off the team at Hawaii, there were two other two kind of three other guys um who were around who i worked out with every day and honestly we uh would shit talk a lot like that's how we got each other hyped up we would just be like be like ah no, no 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 that weight's probably good for you you keep that weight not you stay stay there that's probably good like anything you know like at that age i was just loving it like come on give it to me you know like be in the mirror just like flexing like you ain't got this you know like <laughs> very like we call like cd you know 19 year old boy yes <laughs> um and like, we just loved it. And so like, eventually the phrase just kind of was like, nah, you won't. Don't do that extra. No, 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 you won't. You won't. Don't worry about it. You know? And like, that's, that stuck with me for a while. And then I was kind of like, you know, super into the fitness stuff and started sharing a lot of that on my Instagram. And it was just like, so many kids want like, what's the perfect exercise? What's the, you know, what's the thing to do? Or how can I get better at hitting this? Or how can I, and there's a million things. And I think in this culture now we get so stuck on like the scrolling through TikTok for a thousand things and you you feel like you're doing research. You feel like you're doing something good. But until you go out there and try something, like you've done nothing. You know, so my kind of catchphrase was just like, here's some stuff, but like you won't. It's a challenge, you know. It's a, I think it's a fun way to challenge each other that's not this like uh, you know, you do your best and you can do it. It's like, nah, you won't. Like you're not gonna do it. I don't think you'll do it, you know? So that's where it started. That's kind of what it is. And I, I hope one day to turn it into um, gyms and like, like a facility. I think that would be really cool to do. I have like a really amazing idea for that. Um, but also like just a fun brand. Like, you know, I would shout out to Noe Z Buckets with Dustin Watton. Like he's done an amazing job of like creating a brand for kids that are about volleyball. Because like growing up, I didn't have that. I didn't have like, I mean, none of us had that, you know, there wasn't YouTube was like just starting. I remember watching highlights of like Bruno and Lucas from Brazil and like Dante and like these legends, Lionel Marshall, who had the like 50 inch vertical in Cuba. But those were like, there was like five or 10 volleyball clips on YouTube when I was playing high school, you know? And now it's like, you can watch endless hours of volleyball content out of system, noisy wow. bucket. They're like, so people are finding a way and I'm happy it's the, the group that is choosing to help out and choosing to do something to get kids hyped up on volleyball. And, uh, 
yeah, so we'll see what it turns into in the future. I'm really hoping to do something fun with it. Um, but that's what the idea is. I'm just reminiscing all the times me, me and my friends are like, hey, you won't, you won't go do such and such. It's relatable. Or whatever it is. That's what I'm so saying. Yeah. Relatable. Man. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Mm. And that's but, cool because uh, you've taken that concept from like side by side with your friends in the gym and you made it a, you know, a social media community, the overall volleyball community thing where it's, you're, you're talking to these kids, talking to other people through their phones saying, you know, you won't. And it's health, uh, healthy shame. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I'm, I'm all, I'm all about like finding unique ways to, to get people excited, to get kids excited. And, uh, I've seen so much of the narrative of like, you gotta wake up, you gotta grind, just do what the coach says. And yes, coach. And, and not saying there's not a place for that. There is for sure. But I, I I'm more into like, you want to do it. You won't, you know, like yeah. go do it then, bro. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's not a lecture. Like, like you're not lecturing these, you're not, you're not doing a whole seminar about something, you know, little concept here and then just a little challenge. You won't. Yeah. And you, you that. learn so best cool. through experience. Like you want to yeah. start a podcast. Dude, when I, before I started the podcast, I went through, I got to get the right mic set up. I got to get this. I want it to be, it held me back. I wanted to do it for like six years and it took me so long to finally get to a point of like, record it, dude, put it up. up. That's your task today. Record a podcast. It was just me talking to the camera. It felt weird. I was kept mentioning how I was like, oh, it's weird. I'm like, not talking to anyone. Like such a nerd, you know, like just go do it, bro. And you'll figure it out. Like you're going to figure it out. You know, you want to hit harder. Go try to hit harder. You're still into it. Okay. You're on Instagram. You follow some people. Like you're starting to put some pieces together. Try this exercise. Go try it. Go try it. You know what I mean? Like there's just too many opportunities not to take control of your own destiny nowadays. So that's what I'm about. Learn by doing. Yep. Yeah. Learn by doing. <clears throat> I think that's a good segue to, you know, talk about the tallest podcast on earth. You know, if you want to, you know, give us a little run through of, you know, what, you know, what that podcast is specifically about, uh, how it got started, um, you know, all, all that good stuff too. But, you know, we want to hear about that too. Yeah. Ty, I appreciate you guys allowing me to plug my podcast. I will we'll say with the, uh, with this lifestyle, it can get, difficult to do it consistently so it's kind of like uh, on and off i'm trying and like the more feedback i get from like the community where it's like hey where's the next episode i'm like all right all right let's let's find let's find a way you know um you know i'm trying to find my balance in life too and because there's so much i want to do and like creating content and like i think this year when i go to china like i'm going to start a vlog like i want to start continuing to do things but they take up so much time that you couldn't imagine like even just doing yeah. a podcast it's like you want to do it right like you gotta edit you gotta post you gotta there's so many different little components and pieces so it's really time consuming all the while i have a full-time job trying to stay in shape and play the best volleyball that i can and then you know i got a little puppy and i'm at my girlfriend's place and like you know i want to be able to be free to go have that dinner with a friend you know like those things as i get older mean the most to me is like how i get to spend my time so I'm willing to say no to certain things because it's best for my health. And, you know, as you get older, you start to really learn, I think, like so much about yourself. And that's kind of the journey I'm on, on now, too, is, you know, like continuing to understand myself better and accept certain parts of me and watch myself grow and learn along the way. And that's what the podcast is really about. We talk a lot about mental health and stuff as someone who's gone through bits of depression and um, mental health is like such a taboo not taboo subject like a trending topic you know but like man it's it's our lifestyle is really hard we play volleyball year round we don't get a break you know like we get to do what we love for sure but like you get older your body starts getting beaten up and it's just a lot you know and you're overseas in poland where it's raining all the time and like maybe you got a couple teammates who speak english but like they're not your boys potentially like they are because you're on the same team and you gotta have that and and i've been lucky that like Volleyball players around the world are just cool, dude. Like uh, so many cool people. Um, but you know, I'm my best friend, Ben Patch, my best friend, dude. I love that guy. Miss him so much. Like he's not a national team. Like luckily on the national team, we have a lot of great guys, but like he was my guy, you know? And so it's can be really hard. And so that's what the podcast is partly about. Me sharing and being vulnerable with people um, to show them that like it's okay to feel depressed. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay that 
you know, I have the self-awareness to know not to let my emotions drag me through a game or a practice that I am not the ball I got blocked on. But sometimes I get blocked and I'm like, I'm the worst. What am I doing here? You know, like to this day, dude, it gets so competitive that like, you know, getting blocked that one time can be the difference between you starting on the national team and not like it's the margins are so slim, specifically in the middle blocker position on the national team right now that it's like everything matters. So how do you play your best? Well, you play your best when you feel like nothing matters and you're just playing, you're just flowing, you're doing your thing. So finding ways to stay out of your head becomes like super important and it's so difficult and I think it's okay that it's difficult. Um, and so, yeah, obviously on the podcast, I try to interview like players I like and um, people that I'm inspired by or just volleyball people. And we talk, it's like pretty raw podcast too. So if you're interested in like really knowing who I am, like definitely hop on over. Um, and other players too, I think, um, hopefully my honesty and vulnerability with other players makes them feel comfortable enough to share their truth too, which I think is tight, man. Like, man, when you hear, even for me, right? Like I get inspired by that stuff and I'm sure you guys do too, where it's like, I heard some thing about, uh, when I was like in a really low point in Poland, like I heard something about, uh, Jim Carrey talking about how he dealt with like depression and stuff. And I'm like, Jim Carrey, that guy's hilarious. Like what? You know, I was so surprised and all all these like, let's say public figures come out and talk about and it just humanizes the experience. And I think that's so important to humanize the experience of volleyball to to say that I'm a human, I'm a professional, I'm really good at what I do. I work really hard to get here, but I still struggle with things all the time, dude. And that's okay. And I'm still learning. Like, I'm not here to tell you, like, I got it figured out. I got a lot to share. I think it could help you a lot, which is why I provide one-on-one mentorship if you're interested to a medium. Um, but like, you know, I, I, I still like, and I want to share a lot, but I think something I try to do is have some humility and let kids that I work with know and let people that reach out to me know. And through the podcast, let people know like, dude, I'm a human too. I'm figuring it out just like you. We're in different stages maybe, but like it's a lifelong journey, you know, and that's okay. Yeah. And I think, Sorry. Um, I, I love your, your interview style and your, you know, the format that you've found on your podcast. I've only, you know, truthfully, I've only seen a, a couple of the episodes, a few of the episodes, but, um, you, you said in one of them that it was you trying to get to know your guest. Uh, and I think that brings a lot out from them. It helps them feel comfortable. Uh, and then for you specifically, you're a professional athlete in volleyball and they're in their sport. So I think you can speak to them on that level and then also, um, help them feel comfortable to open up about things. Uh, I really loved your episode with, with Max and Jake. Uh, and it was funny that you said, you know, I'm trying to find time to do things. So you just called Max to come down to interrupt their chess game. I uh, to do a podcast yeah. with them. <laughs> Um, but yeah. Max opened up about his year off too, which, you know, a lot of that I didn't know about. I didn't know he was dealing with, you know, physical wear and tear and mental wear and tear. And, um, I, I took a lot out of that cause I, I had no idea, um, as a, yeah. as a fan of volleyball, as a worker of at USA volleyball, I think that's where social media comes in too. Like we see your lives as professional athletes traveling around the world and but we don't see the other side of it you know the hard parts the dark parts um so yeah i think what you're doing with your podcast i really appreciate to get that other side that real side of professional volleyball and not to trash on professional volleyball there's a lot of good things too that you talk about as well but um that's right there is there's a hard part too yeah we talk about all of it, you know, there are no <laughs> secrets on my podcast. That's for sure. Like we, we keep yeah. it very real and we have a lot of fun, I think. And, uh, to your point of format, like it's probably something I could work on. My format is no format. It's just like, what up, you know, like I, I love think like that Joe Rogan podcast. Works. So I think so too, you know, I, I definitely think so too. And you know, there's some days where I show up to the podcast and I'm like, oh, I'm like tired, should we do it? You know? And I force myself to do it. And hopefully get lost in the moment and oftentimes do and then it's just a blast we take off and i'm like dang it's been two hours there's no way anyone's listening to this anymore like let's bail you know but like that's why a lot of them are super long i just love diving in because i think a lot of times when you do interviews you get like the surface of things you know and um as someone who knows players so intimately all across the world and have shared so many experiences with it's like i know you bro 
You know, I know, I know what you're dealing with. I know a lot of players who are dealing with a lot. You talk about uh, uh, wear and tear. You talk about depression, anxiety for like playing overseas for so long. A lot of players share it. So I hopefully have created a space for them to just be honest and hopefully inspire someone else. And if anything, like have a good time and uh, maybe have a good cry. I've cried on that podcast multiple times with such beautiful people that I really love. And it's such a blessing, honestly. I was uh, I was just going to mention time. I know we um, originally had an hour scheduled for this too, but how are you looking on time? I know uh, are we are we already at an hour? Oh, I feel, feel like we barely scratched the surface. So I just want to make sure we're 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 all good to go to continue. The conversation. Yeah, yeah. I guess you're you're on my format now, dude. Which is like, <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I got till four, so we're good. I got another hour. Whatever you guys need. Okay. Cool. Well, yeah. Just yeah. I yeah, wanted to say you're doing a great job with your podcast. Uh, I've seen you know four or five episodes. Love it so far. I'm excited to check out more. Um, and yeah, the format's great. I I think the format works for what you're doing. And you know, just changing the setting too is is fun. When you did the, I think it was in Micah's garden, that was fun too. Uh, and I think that helps with your guests just to feel a little bit more comfortable too. Me and Micah Maad are trouble together. It's like every time we're together, <laughs> we're just constantly challenging each other to do things. And I mainly lose. I lose a lot. He's like the most athletic and like man of all jack of all trades guy i've ever met um so that we, we just have such a blast i love that dude mm-hmm. i don't I don't know if you just answered it or not but who's been your favorite guest on your show so far <laughs> dude honestly it's too hard to choose i'm so lucky that like i just i have met some of the most beautiful and amazing people and have built amazing relationships through volleyball like you know, you know, Ben Patch, for sure. Our conversation together is so beautiful. Uh, Matteo Piano, another guy who, like, I fell in love with that dude. We just, I went to, when I played it in Milan in Italy, we were teammates and just instantly connected. And we traveled, we went to Madrid together, like, every day off, two days off, we flew somewhere. And, and like, when you're in Europe, flights are, like, 50 bucks or something, you know, we traveled the world together. We had so much fun. Like, I've had so many great teammates and got to meet so many people. And then I've been you know, also surprised by people, you know, who Matt Anderson was one. Like, if you're interested to hear some more on that, like, go check out that podcast. That was really interesting. Matt's an uh, interesting dude. Um, So it was cool to learn about, like, things he struggled with. Because oftentimes for me, as I get older, I'm like, David Smith, you've been doing this for like 20 years, bro. What? Like, how? You don't miss, like, being back home and just, like, you don't fantasize about, like, a chill life where you're not just, like, crushing your body every day. Like... You know, like Max Holt too. I like, dude, how are you still doing this? Like, and Matt Anderson was one of those guys where I'm like, bro, you've been doing this forever. You've been in Russia for like seven straight years. Like, are you going insane? And you hear about his story about how he did a little bit. You know, he really struggled yeah. with things and he had the courage to say, I need to take a break from this contract in volleyball and left and and took time for himself to come back fresh. And, you know, uh, I think I talked about this a lot, I think, but I'm such a big believer in burning out. Like it's so important to burn out. Like you get, you, you see that too with volleyball being taken away. It was taken away from me early and it made me really love it and really know that I needed it in my life. You get an injury, knee injury, shoulder injury, you're out for a little bit. Like that will tell you how much you miss volleyball and how much you love the sport. So I'm a big fan of like, like let yourself burn out. You know, you're tired of volleyball. Like if you have an opportunity, like stop, don't play it. See what life tells you, you know? And oftentimes, at least for me and players that I know, it's like you're itching to get back. Um, and that's a good sign, in my opinion. You find We're, a new love and appreciation for it. I'm sure. I'll give a little bit more perspective. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. What are what are some things that, you know, you do uh, you know, for yourself, or it could be some things that your teammates and friends have shared with you that, you know, help you just maintain mentally up here. You know, so like they're rigorous seasons, you know, life has its toll. And, you know, like you mentioned as well, you know, we're not hiding the ugly, we're not hiding the bad. So, you know, what are some things, you know, that just that help, you know, just kind of maintain every day? It could be volleyball related. It could be, you know, something on, on the hobby basis, just anything. Yeah. Um, a loaded question. There's a lot of answers I could give you for sure. Um, I will say, uh, 
the mental side of things is the biggest challenge in my opinion um you have so many ups and downs from your performance from maybe your life outside of volleyball it all matters like all of it matters you know you can't just have volleyball and then nothing else in your life like it doesn't work you need balance and so you know for me um Look, I'll be honest, like I, in the last year, found a new therapist and he's been incredible. It's actually a different style of therapy. It's called somatic experience. If you're interested, you can look it up. Um, but what it's really helped me do is understand myself on like a completely new level. And what I recognize a lot of times is like, even with the podcast, social media stuff, like why I take breaks unannounced sometimes is because that's what's best for me. You know, and like I'm finding my balance to like, can I find path of least resistance to keep continually put that stuff out for my community and also make sure I'm doing good? Because what happens is as an athlete, we're so used to shaming ourselves for not showing up, not eating the right thing, not doing the right thing. Like you should have, wow, like I got seven hours of sleep before the game. I played bad. Like, come on, man, you can't do that. You've got to get better sleep. You've got to be performing or whatever it is. You know, it's like constant because we're so competitive. And I think I'm finally entering a, an era in my life of acceptance. And, you know, there's a difference between just doing something uh, just to do it and knowing what you're doing. Like, if I want to have a drink after a game that we won. I'll have a drink, but I'm not going to have a drink because I'm trying to escape something or like that. I'm just going to get drunk because like I don't do that anymore. You know, like to me, it's like I do what I want. If I want to do that. I'll do it have a couple of drinks. I'll have some fun with the guys, you know, but oftentimes, especially as I get older, I'm like, oh, I have two beers and like my feet are swollen. So <laughs> um, like, nah, I'm trying to feel good all the time. And, uh, you know, so that's been having someone to talk to, like to hold you accountable is huge. And I also noticed that I mentioned before, I do like one-on-one on mentorship stuff with a few clients and, um, that's really humbled me as well. Like teaching has been something that's kept me like balanced, I would say, you know, is recognizing like, look at their eyes, how stoked they are, like how much they have to learn. Like, don't forget to do that for yourself. You know, like you preach about with a lot of the kids I work with, we'll do like, uh, I kind of run them through like my game day and I send them like 10 and 15 minute kind of like uh, meditation, visualization practice stuff that I write out for them. And it's like, do this before practice or a game day. And then I'll realize like my game day routine is before I, do 10 minutes of breath work. I do like five minutes of meditation with like 10 minutes of visualization before every game. And I feel great. I feel good. I feel prepared. But then I'm like, why am I not doing that for other areas of my life? Like, why am I only doing that for game day? You know? So some of those practices that I'm sure everyone listening knows about, like meditation and those things, like I would be lying to you if I said, yeah, I consistently meditate. Um, but I've gone through periods of that and then periods of like, ah, I don't need to anymore. And I always end up getting like bringing it back to like, Right now, I'm learning how to slow down. I'm le learning how to be okay taking a day to just watch Netflix because I'm tired from training and not giving myself the guilt of like, you're just going to be like everyone else. You're just going to watch Netflix and just zone out and like not put out that podcast or not do that thing or not schedule or to meet with this club. Or like you're going to, you're just going to like chill because that's the, the path of least resistance I'll say is just to be a volleyball player and like dude it's pretty sweet you know some days my my work time is three hours and then I have the rest of the day to do whatever I want you know um, so I think just trying to be aware trying to be like gracious with myself along the way um, and trying to put things out and challenge myself you know like doing these things is challenging it takes e extra effort and work especially because they're already potentially like podcasting could be a full it is a full-time job for some people you know like mentorship stuff academy online academy that's all full-time stuff if you want it to be and we're such perfectionists as athletes it's like oh no no, no i got it's got to look like this and like this and i got to write this out and like there's so many things i want, want to do the podcast i want it to be a studio and like, I want people to fly in. Like, there's so many things I want to do. And like, I'm in a period now of just like, yo, it's all good. You're training for the Olympics. It's a big deal. Like, enjoy that. Don't lose yourself. And like, you got to do this, do, do, do. Um, but as athletes, it's tough because for most of us, we've been playing sports our whole lives. My life is due. So when I have a day off and I do nothing, I literally feel like I'm wasting away. <laughs> so I work a lot with my therapist to be like, what is your body telling you? 
Like, is it telling you you want to relax? Like, listen, just relax. It's okay. Draw, read, write, like do some other things, you know, like it's okay. Don't do them to uh, one day make it a business for yourself. Like I do a lot of creative writing in the morning. I write short stories and just like fun, stupid things, you know, like I don't do it because I'm trying to be a creative writer one day, which not out of the cards maybe, but like it is something I'm interested in. But like I do it because it's just fun, man. Like find those other outlets and don't put so much pressure on yourself to be this thing. Like those things will take care of itself by the actions you take every day. So hopefully uh, Taylor's uh, short stories come out soon. I would love to, or one day, I would love to to read some of those. <laughs> No, you wouldn't. I think I would. I think I would. Um, you mentioned, uh, um, you know, seeing a therapist and all that. We're talking about mental health. It's a it's a tough subject, especially for young kids who are going through it. And what you know, what advice would you have? And this maybe comes into play with some of your mentorship that you're doing. But what advice would you have for you know a young athlete or young kid who's going through depression or um, some sort of mental struggle? to take that first step to um, try to better that? Um, well, first of all, you're not alone, you know? And I think that's why I think it's so important that, that older athletes are able to be vulnerable with younger kids, with everyone around them to create a world where those things are okay and they're normalized, you know? Um, uh. Yeah, because I, you know, grew up in the culture of like, shut up and work. My dad, I grew up in the culture of like suicide time, boys, line up, you know, like, okay, for those of you who don't know, suicide is not killing yourself. It's touching lines and running back and forth. Anyways, um, so like, I think it's a, it's a different era we're in now and we are starting to open up and it's starting to be like a normal thing to be like, yeah, today was the tough day for me. And then that's okay. And the, the part that, it's taken time for me to get to this place, but I feel like I'm in a place now of like, what an opportunity, what an opportunity to show up to practice, be tired or not want to do it and do it anyways. Like you get to learn so much through that process. So it's like actually every day is like a new creative expression that I have to learn from and to give because some days I show up and I'm just uh, you know, like I'm vibing, I'm feeling it, I'm playing good, I'm jumping high, I'm hitting hard, no one can touch me, like it's just great. And then some days I show up and I'm like, this drill sucks, or this sucks, or I can't jump, or I'm tired, I worked out hard earlier, I start making excuses. Um, So I try now to have a little more self-awareness just to like see things as a challenge and enjoy that and be okay that like some things are hard, be okay that like you can have five games in a row where you play great and you have one bad game and that game doesn't have to define who you are, you know? And and I I empathize with those who feel that way because as someone who has worked really hard to be one of the best in the world, um, I still struggle with that. Go on ESPN, dude. So does Novak. So does like, so do these amazing, great players. Like we all struggle with it. So it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. And I, I, I put a lot of... Um, I don't want to say pressure, but like ownership on coaches too, to build an environment where your players can be who they are, can express how they feel, because I think that stuff matters a lot. You know, like again, talking about like human first, athlete second um, is kind of how I try to take the approach. And uh, so there are plenty of tools out there. Like luckily for Instagram, there are a thousand things you can at least start to learn about um, and start to develop awareness for. Um, but I, I think so much of that real change happens in your environment. So if you're hanging around people who are the complainers, it's easy to join in because that's your, that's your team. That's your crew. You know, like you're going to adapt to your environment, which means you'll probably be a little more complaining. And guess what? It won't work for you. And maybe you need that. Like that was me too, dude. Like sometimes I was with a crowd or a team where I was like, you're right. This does suck. <laughs> you know, like, oh, cool. Like this hotel bed is hard you know what i mean like it's just so easy yeah. so um find your people you know what i mean find the people who inspire you to be better and are who are fun and you feel you know in some way a pull towards in like a healthy way and and that's what i try to offer to the kids i work with is to be the guy who's like yo i'm not your coach i'm not your dad i'm not here to tell you what to do 
I'm here to share with you and help guide you along your journey. So it's flexible, it's malleable, it changes. Like, like um, and I try to provide tools like breath work, meditation, visualization. Like those things are huge in my life. Uh, um, so those are the things I would share for people who are like, to answer your question, I guess, like I'm struggling because I suck or whatever. Or like I'm, I'm like I get people who write me all the time where like I'm a bench player. Like how do I? I, I want to get on the starting six so bad. What do I do? You know, and it's like everyone's situation is is so different. So you start with the things you can control, and uh, you know, as you work on those things and put in the work, you start to see results. And if you're, you know, for me it was like I saw those results and I was like, this is my life. I love this so much. I love seeing these healthy habits turn into my performance in a beautiful way. And uh, some of that is stepping back too, is being like. Let's, let's let's have some humility you know it's easy to get really good at something and get all that praise that you're the best and get lost in that which a lot of great players do because everyone's constantly telling them you're the best look how good you are you know that then they attach their identity so much to that volleyball player who does this and sounds like this that when they don't have that performance they hit a massive low um, and the best ones are really resilient why because it's practiced it's not being so attached to good and bad and trying to find that's a little more philosophical in the way I believe, but like trying to find that medium of just like enjoy the process and the rest takes care of itself. I think you brought up for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. I, I, uh, I think you brought up a good point earlier too. That'll be kind of good to know for, you know, players across um, the board, no matter what sport you're playing, no matter what level of volleyball you're playing too. What are some things that, you or methods that you've seen um coaches apply you know to their environment that help reduce that healthy atmosphere that healthy you know environment around the gym dude if i'm being super honest i haven't had a lot of coaches who i feel like created a really healthy environment <laughs> but there are a few you know, um you know, John has his way of doing it, which I think is great. He checks in with players. Um, he brings in, like he brought in uh, this guy, Pete, who's like a Navy SEAL specialist to talk about a bunch of different topics. And I think that stuff can be really useful um, and healthy and trying to bring in healthy resources. I will say shout out to USOPC and USA Volleyball um, for covering things like therapy and those types of resources for us players who could really benefit from it and use it. And if you're a pro listening to this, like don't sleep on that. Like that's a, to me, it's been a huge blessing that they've helped cover some of that stuff. Um, but to answer your question, like I do think, um, for example, Javier Weber, who's our assistant coach on the national team, he coached me two years in Poland. I love him to death. He's my, my original godfather of volleyball, let's say guy I connected with the most. His name was Milan Zarkovic. He's the assistant coach at Hawaii. I learned so much from him. So grateful that I had my experience with him. And Javier Weber is another one of those guys who, um, you know, when we're in the volleyball court, it's like, we're here to talk about volleyball. Don't bring your other baggage into this. Like, like be present and let's play and talk about volleyball. And then he's also the person off the court to be your best friend if you need it, to talk about things if you need it. And um, I think that's really important, you know? It's like, like we don't need to stop practice to have this huge talk and breakdown. And that's something I learned from Milan Zarkovic, A, because he's Serbian and doesn't speak the best English. So like a lot, a lot of times when we're like, there's no kids are like, wait, so I should do this with my arm? Or like, wait, so this drill is, and he was just, no, 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 just go, just go. Like, just go, you're going to figure it out. And you do figure it out eventually. You know, so it's kind of like this balance of like, I think where that message can get lost is like that we need to do tons of talking and we need to check in all the time and do those things. It's like, I don't necessarily think that either. You know, I just think that um, when coaches can create an environment, A, that makes their training gym fun and that get kids hyped and stoked to be there, especially because they're not pros yet. Like, dude, get them hyped. That is the number one thing for me. And then can you be that person of, let's say, authority who could also be like, I am you, bro. You know, and that's at least what I try to do with like kids that I work with is like, I'm no different than you. You know, I'm not over here like 
uh, I've had coaches before, you know, who like didn't say a lot. It just seemed very much like they knew everything. And I was just like, they were just there to analyze me. And uh, I think showing when coaches show that human side of them, it makes you connect with them on a different level and it makes you respect them on a different level. And for coaches, it makes kids buy into what you're doing on a different level. And that creates the ultimate goal of hopefully winning more and and having it be something that people love and enjoy, you know, um, and I'm sad to say I don't played, you know, eight years overseas and had a lot of coaches in my career and I haven't always seen the healthiest environments and no fault of coaches either, you know, like a lot of the coaches I've had have been great people, you know, and then you'd see them coach and I'm just like, what? Like, I'm confused. Like, you're this awesome person off the court, but like, you won't allow yourself to like, you know, uh, if, if kids are coming and complaining about how like, do we used to this one team I was on? We never used score six on six warm up drills. There was no score. So there was no competing. After a while, it's like we're all pros. It's like if we're not playing for a score or for something. And like, we're just going through the motions. And we used to talk to him like, hey, can we have a score? Can we have a score? And he's like, mm, OK, we'll play to five or like something like that. You know, and it's like, dude, listen to your players, you know, like find a balance and so when coaches can show that vulnerable side it makes players feel like they can be heard and it just creates a more cohesive team and i think that goes for all workplaces you know like um and it's a special place in my heart because since i was young my parents would laugh if they heard this but like i was not the person to be don't tell me what to do you know it's got to be explained it's got to be i just don't just tell me because you're my mom or my dad like i'm what you know like explain it to me i just i was curious like why you know, so uh, I'm very aware of those things and I'm doing my best to hopefully change some of that narrative um, in like a healthy way for our sport. I love this conversation, love what hearing about what you're doing with the community in volleyball and giving back like you're talking about here. But um, and we can fill a series of episodes diving into <laughs> mental health and maybe we will down the road. Um but you've got some great episodes too on the tallest podcast on earth, uh, diving into the, the subject a little more. So definitely listeners check that out. Uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about Taylor and his journey, uh, and some advice, but really want to steer the conversation forward again and, and talk a little bit more about your time with the national team, uh, specifically this summer, um, one BNL or sorry, didn't win Vinyl silver at BNL, but one world cup. Uh, and qualified for the Olympics. So congratulations on that. But for you and, and maybe for the team, some of the conversations you've had with some of your teammates, what does that mean? You know, you're going to the Olympics. The The men's national team is going to Paris. But further on, what does that mean for the team? You're looking ahead to 2024 as you prepare for uh, the games. Uh, yeah, I mean, we had a great summer. Um, this was a fun summer for sure. And we're probably the deepest we've ever been. I would say right now, I like all guys who travel could play and come in and do damage. Like <clears throat> that's pretty special because a lot of teams overseas with the handful, with the exception of maybe like, I would say Poland's probably in my opinion, like maybe the best in the world at that right now, their league is also incredible and so deep. Right. And those guys have like 10 outside hitters who would be could be the best in the world like they're they're pretty deep but so are we and so that's pretty awesome to feel like when you get taken out because you're having a bad game that the person who's backing you up is going to go in there and like do a good job and that showed we used everyone this summer and it was pretty amazing um to get the results that we had you know i will say now it's part of it is uh managing our health we got a, a veteran team and I think it shows and, and um, it also means that we have to be really taking care of our bodies um, leading up to the Olympics, you know, which maybe doesn't change a lot of protocols for a lot of guys. But um, for me, at least, it's like definitely a premium right now of like, I want to feel good when my season ends and I'm stepping into the national team gym in May, you know, I, I want to feel great. So what can I do to be feeling great at that time? So there's a lot of things you can tweak from like a training perspective um you know and the the last thing i'll say to talking about burning out it's like what happens to a lot of guys 
is you go overseas and it's eight months in a country that is not your home country, that you do not speak the language, and that's most likely freezing. <laughs> you know, like most likely yeah. cold and cloudy. So what happens a lot is guys come back home and they're like, oh, give me that two weeks off. Or like, you know, if your team loses in the playoffs, you're like, oh no, now I get an extra week. Or like, that's the honest truth. Like guys come home and they're like, dude, give me some time to like be with my family and go to the beach or do whatever. And we need some of that. We also need to make sure that the turnaround time is pretty quick and we don't have a ton of time to train together in the summer. So it's also going to be, um, I don't know, interesting, important to figure out how can we finish our pro seasons like ready and hyped on the summer ahead, you know? So that'll look different for everyone, I'm sure. Um, but in my opinion, like that's, that's what it's about, you know, like find a way to finish your pro season feeling good and stoked on the summer. And obviously it's an Olympic summer, so I'm sure everyone will be stoked and excited to be in the gym. There's no doubt about that. But to like really feel like, oh, I'm so ready. I feel good. Like, let's do it. Um, so I'm, dude, I'm hyped. Like, I'm, I'm so hyped to even get an opportunity to compete for a spot to go. Like, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's just sick. It's so fun. So, can you talk about some of the, uh, I would say some of the more memorable highlights from the season and also about some of the, uh, you know, moments where, you wish you could have maybe had back or, you know, uh, you know, done over again, if you had a chance to. Hmm. It's a great question. Um, well, I will say, uh, in terms of like the best moments, like Tokyo was amazing. I love Japan. That was so much fun. And as much as like the volleyball and winning feels great, um, to just like hanging out with guys in Japan, getting sushi together and just like, chopping it up that's the best bro like those are the things you remember when you finish playing volleyball you know what i mean and like i was very humbled by that when you know i went to hawaii and we made it to the ncaa tournament for like the first time in I don't know how many years and we lost but like it was a big deal we were a good team we were number one in the nation for most of the year like we were, had such a good season two three four five six years Two years, two summers ago, I watched them play Ball State. They ended up winning. Hawaii ends up winning the national championship. No one knows who I am. Most guys don't know who I am. Like, you know, like you, life moves on. And then there's the next best player and the next best team. And like, so the things that that's why I harp so much on like being a human first is like, those are the things you're going to take home with you. Relationships you've made, like things you did together, things where like shit hit the fan and like, you know, like something happened and it, how hilarious that like this guy some you know or like guy lost a bet and he has to shave half his head like those kind of things to me are like those are the things you remember forever so uh i i love that i'm in a, a position to be on a team with guys who are like super fun like we have a really fun group you know um so yeah being in japan walking around the streets getting sushi like getting lost in tokyo for a little bit is like discovering some amazing new spot for like you know, i love sushi personally and love fish so it was like i was in heaven you know um all the games like we play a game called finny which is a card game and i'll say me and max holt were partners it's two on two and uh, we made a lot of money on the box <laughs> a lot of money dude. but i'm telling you uh shout out to michael ma who had a great attitude while he was losing dollar <laughs> thomas deski cj defalco uh, Matt Anderson for a little bit. Those guys were great sports, but me and Max Holt cleaned house. So that felt pretty good. Um, and then, you know, things things that were, you said, look back on and like, you know, kind of in some way regret or like with things I wish I could take back. But of course I feel that way. There's definitely every moment, every mistake I made, I wish I could have it back, you know? And I'll tell you what, like the honest truth, it's a battle in the middle right now. We got Max Holt, David Smith, Jeff Jedrick and myself like really fighting for three spots go to the Olympics you know like we don't need to dance around it I love all those guys so much I want to go to the Olympics you know what I mean we all love each like it genuinely like the middle group specifically and that's why I have so much love for middles um it's just like a unique family let's say but you know it's it's hard when it's like you have a bad game and as someone like me I'm not like you know, Max Holt or David Smith who have been to Olympics and have started like been like starters. Like 
I have my moments where like I'm the starter now, you know, and like I had played a great game like in VNL, you know, I had a couple like really good games and I'm like so hyped and proud of myself. And I'm like, see, dude, you can be a starter. You're the guy. And then you have like, you know, maybe I had a good game, an okay game, but like I couldn't commit block. I remember playing against Brazil and like, dude, you're just getting burnt. Like could not stuff this guy. And, you know, you put in Jeff. Jeff comes in and stuffs a guy. Like he's a big dude, jumps well. Like, you know, oh, and then I'm like, oh. like a part of me is on the bench just like, I could have done that or I got to do that you know it's like dude I would be lying to you if I if I didn't say that that's the truth that like that happens where it's like I love you but I want to go to the you know it's like a weird dynamic and you see that in a lot of positions where it's like setter two second setter position is kind of like Micah Ma'a Josh Tuniga like you know you see that too where it's like dude luckily genuinely we all have so much love for each other and we're all like the biggest supporters of each other so that's amazing and we talked all throughout this podcast about like not being so connected to good and bad and how I'm like, yeah, there's tons of tools. Yeah, I practice it all the time, but I am not perfect and I am human. And guess what? I want to go more than you. You know what I mean? Like, you know, so it's 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 really tough and it tests your character so much. And so when I look back on my summer, I wish I would have had, um, I wish I would have been a better teammate at times. And that's, those are things that you would never know from watching the games. You would never assume really probably either. But like, you know, there were times where if someone came in for me or I watched someone play good and I was like, Damn. like, I wish that was me, you know, I wish I could have another game like that. And uh, near the end of the tournament at Olympic qualifier, I feel like I started to find the stride of like, hey, man, keep yourself in check. You know, you're doing the best you can. When you get your opportunity, go play. You earned it go get it you don't play great all good bro you know like your that one moment does not define you as a player and it can feel that way a lot you know especially at this level nation or you know worldwide everyone's watching like those mistakes feel way heavier than they are in reality and yeah the margins are super slim no doubt you know but like trying to find a way to be like i'm gonna do the best when i can when i'm off i'm gonna do the best to support david smith or Jeff or Max and be like, when they come off the bench, be like, Hey, here's what I'm seeing. Like on a perfect pass, you know, the setter ha- does not playing in the middle right, right now, you know, or like, Hey, this guy's hot. It's 22, 22, like trying to scheme with them, listen to them, make them feel heard. And like, also try to, you know, help show them what I see. And, and we do that for each other all the time, dude, where it's like, Hey, like this ball, like jump in the middle. Do they haven't set them? Like if it's a, if a lot of times, like really good setters don't set the middle when it's like perfect, perfect on the net. They'll maybe have some tendency to set them like three, four, five, six, seven feet off the net. So it's like trying to know what we know about the opponent and share that with whoever's in the, on the court. And dude, that's why, I mean, Micah Christensen, Micah Ma'a, like there's so many examples of that on our team, on the national team of guys who get taken out or aren't playing for whatever reason in the game that are on the bench. Like I'm your number one fan. And that to me, those are the guys that I look up to and try to be myself you know yeah thank you for being honest and vulnerable in that um i it's i can't even imagine that's that's got to be such a hard position to be in especially like you mentioned earlier just a, such a deep team uh across the board at every position um that let me know, say something too yeah sorry sorry to interrupt you steve go no go, go ahead talking already, honestly. please go ahead please go ahead. But I, I think that's you know that's the thing that like uh the guy who finished second place in the Olympics or like the guy who finished fourth place in the Olympics in like a sprint or something, or like, you know, the guy who doesn't make it. No one talks about that guy. That's hard for athletes to deal with. You know, imagine like, you know, for example, the last Olympics, I ruptured my plantar fascia right before we were going to go to Italy. I recovered in like three or four weeks and was able to go and didn't have my best chance. Felt like I should have got more. Don't go to the Olympics. And I'm just in my mind, like, no one's ever going to know. I'm an Olympic level player. I'm one of the best in the world. I prove it when I'm overseas. I've had great seasons in the best leagues in the world. And it's like, it's that ego just being like, no, mm-hmm. no, nah, nah, that's got to be me. That's got to be me. And uh, I have a lot of empathy um, for those guys who didn't make it. There's a lot of Olympic level players who never made it to the Olympics, especially men's volleyball. And it's weird. We talked about this too as a team, like in a lot of, a lot of other sports, You can bring a backup and a second backup and like a basketball team with 20 guys or whatever it is, you know, but for some reason, I don't know what the rule is in volleyball. You can only bring 12 when in the summer, 14 to 16 travel every tournament, 
you know? So it's like, makes you feel like, oh, I wasn't good enough, you know? And that is really, really hard. Trying to accept that I'm an Olympic level player who will, might never go to the Olympics is not easy, you know? It's not easy for my, my ego, you know what I mean? And so I try to keep the perspective too of like, remember, this doesn't define who you are as a person. Yeah, and that's hard. You know what I mean? It's really, really hard. It's hard to accept that like, you know, it's like, dude, when you have a good game and people on Instagram write you, you and they're like, dude, you're the best. Or that was sick. You're just like, oh, oh, hitting me with dopamine. I'm like, oh, I'm love. And people think I'm so great. And then, you know, the bad things happen and you're just like, whoa, you know? So again, like bringing everything back to like, one moment does not have to define you. It will feel like it's defining you, but it will pass. And as you move on, it's like, do any of you guys remember the team of in the seventies who won the Olympics? Like, no, you know what I mean? <laughs> then you're just some right. old dude who used to play in the Olympics or didn't or whatever. Like, it doesn't matter. It, I mean, it I should say it doesn't matter. It's also an amazing accolade and like very hard to do. And I also have so much love for people who have gone and have endured you know, for example, Garrett Maututia had been in the gym for so long. Last year, he goes to the yeah. Olympics. To me, that's incredible. Like, he stuck through so much of always being the fourth and always, and he finally stayed through long enough. And he's someone who's also very poised and knows his role and does his thing. Another great example of like a really humble guy in that way got his chance. You know, like you see that, yeah. and you're like, hell yeah, dude, like that's sick because it's hard, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. No, thank you for that. That was awesome. Yeah. What would, uh, what would um, making the roster for Paris mean to you? You know, all that said, you know, I know it's give and take, trying to be the best teammates uh, you possibly can while staying competitive, you know, and your team all all positions have a healthy competitive, you know, environment around uh, you all and, you know, playing overseas and, you know, having your time with the national team. What would making that roster, uh, you know, this time around mean to you? Clarence, it mean the world to me. No, I'm kidding. I mean, it would. It would be sweet. Obviously, it would be sweet. You know, like, what, am I, what, am I, what can I tell you? Like, of course, that would be amazing, you know, um, for so many reasons. And, um, you know, one of them is like, I know I have what it takes to help our team win. So do the other guys on our team. You know, like, I want to be able to prove that and just show that, you know, I want to go to a tournament that's like the holy grail of tournaments, you know, yeah. like. I want that experience, dude. I want to know what it's like. You know what I mean? Like all of that stuff. Um, and I guess like I'm like downplaying the question in some way to bring it back to like, I'm going to do my best not to let it define me one way or the other. You know, that it's like, if I don't go to the Olympics, I'm still a baller. I still work hard. I still get to do the thing I love. That's got to be enough, you know? And I got to accept, and this is something to get like deeper with me, like something I'm really working on now is like, accept that, accept that you're doing this because you love it and let the results come as they may. Um, because that's the only way to, to bring out the best in you. If you stay attached to results, you're just going to ride this gnarly roller coaster. And as someone who's ridden it off the tracks and like all over the place, I'm telling you, it's exhausting. So, you know, to me, it's like, if I make the Olympics, like I'll be so grateful and so stoked. And if I don't make the Olympics, I'm gonna be so proud of myself for working just as hard. You know what I mean? Um, I, I, jo I like, I have those moments too. And like, uh, you know, you think about guys in the NBA who are making millions of dollars. And uh, for those of you who don't know, all players are not making millions of dollars. And, uh, and I'm like, dang, I work just as hard as those dudes in the NBA. I guarantee it. I'm in the weight room for hour and a half to two hours, three to four times a week. I'm jumping like crazy. I'm practicing five days a week, sixth day, having a game. Like, you know, we're working just as hard. I'm not getting paid nothing compared to those guys. You know, my ego's like, that's bullshit. Like, no, what? Like, I wish, I wish. Like, so it's, it's trying to be humble. And that's why, like, none, none of that should matter if you're doing what you love. Like, that's what I believe. And getting to do what you love is honestly a privilege for a lot of people. And I'm very privileged to, get to do what I love for a living and that needs to be enough. So I'm kind of like saying this out loud to hopefully like genuinely believe it. It doesn't mean I wouldn't be hurt. I would be, you know, super hurt to not go to the Olympics. And at the same time, like I hope that I can look at the next upcoming Olympics and go with humility or not go and be the best teammate I can and be like, I'm stoked for you guys. You know, that'll be my test. And I'm excited to 
um, work towards that and give my best towards that and uh, see what kind of man I am when that day comes. Yeah, well, either way, congratulations on just, you know, having that opportunity to compete for the spot uh, and being in that situation. And like you said, playing the game that you love, uh, playing volleyball uh, at such a high level, um, such an awesome achievement in itself. Uh, and good luck to you. Good luck to the team uh, as you guys train and compete next year and, and get gear up for the Olympics. Uh, excited to watch that squad for sure. Yep. Sick. Hey man, this could be the year too, dude. I'm gonna be honest. Like we had a good summer for sure, but like squad's looking good. Squad squad's looking good. Yeah, squad's looking deep high. in all the right places. Yep. That's fair. All right. Yeah. A lot of experience coming back too. That's it's oh, yeah. awesome. Yeah. They're looking great. Yeah. Um, kind of to wrap things up here, just wanted to, you know, hear about your uh off season right now. What are you doing? Uh are you planning to go overseas? Uh what's going on? <laughs> oh, I wish it's sorry if I've been on a sour note. <laughs> I no. should have navigated this a little better. <laughs> no, I'm gonna do my best to yeah, just keep it. I don't know, really honest. And the honest truth is, like, I'm I'm was supposed to go to Shanghai, go play in China. Yeah. It was a big deal opportunity for me because it's hard to get in a league that pays great and is like, uh, <laughs> doesn't have a huge foreigner like they have foreigner rules out there. It's hard to get a contract as a middle to go play in China. So I'm very grateful that I got that opportunity this last year to go this year. Um, turns out it's not so simple to get a visa to go to China. So we are currently in a stage of uh, the waiting game a little bit. So, you know, you saw me training with my dad and doing other stuff. It's like, I'm doing my best to stay in the best shape. Also, if you're in LA, I don't know when this podcast will come out. But assuming it comes out in like the next week or so, if you're in LA, specifically I'm in Silver Lake, hit me up. I'm trying to play like with whoever, you know, I'm just trying to touch the ball and have a good time and keep my body ready and resilient to go. So, um, yeah, that's the situation I'm in. It's uh, one of those like accepting you. We talked a lot about like balance and finding acceptance and yeah. it's like a, it's a bit of like a corny term, but like surrender in some way. I had these another challenging time for me, you know was supposed to go October 25th. The season starts November 12th. Um, I might miss some of the first beginning of the season now, you know, like I might go later. They could call me in a couple of days and be like, hey, you got the papers. We're good to go. Like you're out in five days. Like I'm I feel like I'm, uh, you know, the volleyball military just like waiting to be deployed, basically. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm stay I'm staying ready. And uh, yeah, doing my best to also like use this time I get to be here. My girlfriend's on a surf trip right now, but like here with the dog, chilling. My brother lives close. I get to spend more time with him. I got to see my dad, like doing my best to, you know, enjoy the time I have and not put this stress on. Like, I gotta be in the best shape and I gotta, I do want to be doing those things. And I love going and training and like super into like the fitness stuff, as people who follow me on Instagram definitely know, you know, like I've learned so much. I love sharing it. I love doing it. Um, so it's a trialing time for me right now, too, you know, to like, embrace what's going on and dude i'm just a big believer in like if you can master adaption and like being present like you're set bro you are set like so that, that's what we're working on as a human and also as a volleyball player love that yeah thank you for sharing and being honest with that yeah. Yeah. clarence you uh you're going out to la anytime soon to i wish i was could pop in <laughs> come on man <laughs> got some connections for me out here what's up I mean, I could, I could ask. I'm, I'm, I'm from Long Beach originally too, so I can definitely ask around. Where there's open gyms at? I don't, I don't know. There is any problem. This, my, my biggest problem right now is like, okay, so like, I know, I obviously like, I'm friends with a lot of people who are like either playing beach now or whatever. It's like I could go do those things. Problem is, when you live in like the heart of LA, there's so much freaking traffic everywhere. Everywhere. Like, if I want to, I want to go to Long, I want to go to Long Beach. I'm going in an hour, guaranteed. I'm be in traffic for an hour, so it's like become it's like an all day event, you know. So I actually found this club. I think it's SG Elite or something. That's actually like six yeah, minutes man. down the road. And so I'm like, really? they've been yeah. nice enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've been nice enough to be like, yeah, you can come in and train. And like, sick. This is so nice. It's really close by. I got a gym that I actually really love really close to awesome. five. So like we have the things we need. Um, but yeah, I'm always looking for if someone hit me up and was like, yo, I'm in your area. Like, let's, I also got a sick grass net I can set up, dude. So like, uh, you know, That's it. come play with your boy, dude. I'm open, open invitation. Might have to come out. 
Listeners, well, listeners. I think I'm over due for a trip to visit some family too. But yeah, yeah I mean, I'll ask April 13th, we'll hit me up <laughs> on Instagram. If you want to come play with me, I'm down on the house. Let's do it. I love that. I love that. Well, yeah. good luck to you. Hopefully you're Thanks, getting man. out to China here soon. But yeah, enjoy the time that you have right now. Like you mentioned, eight months out of the year is tough. So yeah, hang on to, to spend some time with the girlfriend and the dog and your dad. So yeah. Uh, enjoy that while That's you can right. yeah um let's yeah let's just kind of wrap things up i guess you know a little higher note because we ended on a little sour note there what's your i think breakfast is your favorite food what's your go-to breakfast dude let me tell you what <laughs> i've had a breakfast burrito every single day since i got well, love yes every day yes. and i'm like i'm not like i'm not just like any breakfast burrito there's a place down the street called forage they got the like uh, house roasted potatoes, bacon, mm-hmm. avocado. They put a little poblano in it. Dude, I'm like a oh, breakfast heck yeah. on a sewer. So I'm all about the little details. I care about those little details in a breakfast burrito. It's a good size. It's filling. It's got all the things I like in it. It's just very well done. They have this like nice, like kind of tomato-y sauce, like hot sauce, but not too hot. So money. Um, and I will say, I think DoorDash should be uh, a sponsor of mine because I have spent <laughs> so much money this summer, dude. It, it's embarrassing. It is embarrassing. It is crazy. Like I, I, you know, if you cook <laughs> when we're overseas, a lot of times, like we're cooking our own meals for the most part, at least for me, you know? So like, like when you live in Italy, it's like, I'm not trying to eat pasta and pizza every night. And I'm not trying to go out every day. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, you're cooking your own food, but Dude, that stuff takes time. You guys know. I don't know if any of you have kids or like other responsibilities. We all got our things that we want to do. Like, dude, you got to go to the store and get food. Then you got to prepare it and cook it. Then you eat it. That's the easy, fast part. And then you got to clean up all that stuff after now you're like tired from some massive meal you just cooked. Like, dude, it takes time. And now for me, it's like, luckily I'm in a position where like I can afford to do that right now because that will not be the rest of my life. But I'm like giving myself the like, you know what, dude? I want to be able to spend an hour like hanging out and just talking with my friends or my girlfriend and or play with the dog or go take him for a walk and not do that. So just for dinners, a lot of times, to be honest, I'm, I'm door dashing my mind out of here. Um, trying, I just like now that I'm home for a little, like, all right, we got to like go to the store and get something. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I've been the door dash god over here. <laughs> Love that. Door dash, if you're listening, call us podcast. Dude, hit, hit, hit me up. <laughs> hey, dude, hit me up. I hear that. Yeah. The time, the time it takes, it's, it's a lot. I do have, I have a two month old, uh, and, uh, I, I'm a, I used to be a clean freak, like the dishes. I, I, I could not go to bed with 30 dishes in the sink and hey, look at you now, Steve. Hey, look at me now. And I've yeah, got like, like literally on the floor back here, there's 30 uh, diapers just piled up. <laughs> yeah. I believe it, dude. I believe it. it's hard, man. I'm telling you, even it's so funny. Like I try to act like I can relate to parents now because I have a puppy we've been watching, you know, but I'm just like, dude, it's full. It's full time until she's potty trained or whatever. It's like, I got to make sure she's not you know, eating up the furniture. I got to make sure she's not pooing and peeing and we don't catch her because then she doesn't learn that like, you know, you don't do that in the house. You know, it's like, right. dude, it's so full time. It's like, at first it was a lot of anxiety. She's crying in the kennel at night. It's like, dude, it's a lot. So I can only imagine what he was being. <laughs> I might, it might be a little nicer though because it's like, you know, something that you made and like yeah. probably love on like such a different level. But it made me realize like, dude, I'm a softie, bro. <laughs> I'm such a softie. Like, well, thank God my girlfriend's like, case. Cute dog. That's what I'm saying. And it's so little and vulnerable. So I think yeah. if it was like a big dog, I would be a little more like, hey, get in here. Go touch. Go get that thing. Yeah. You know? It's you your know, you're, you're like, you're like, yeah, don't do that. And in first thought, you're like, oh, come here. It's okay. Come on. <laughs> I'm telling you, when we first when we first got it, like we wanted like Hannah, my girlfriend, wanted it to be kennel trained, you know. So that way if we are out of town or like it gets comfortable, it has its own space. That's hard. A lot of people give up on that real early, you know. Because <laughs> like night one, it's like whining and crying and like barking all through the night and i'm like just let it sleep in the bed dude what are we doing you know like come on like i'm just so soft so i'm like yeah i'm also just probably a really sensitive to the world kind of person and like i'm definitely a softie you know right there so i'm like kind of learning learning how to be a pack leader i learned a lot about dogs learned that they need a pack leader like giving them some of that structure is actually helpful for them so you'll get and survive and be happy and not be anxious so now i'm that pack leader <laughs> that's right. she's staring she's staring right at me she knows watch it, it. watch it kind of 
we kind of look the same. We have the same haircut. So I feel like maybe in some way she's like, all right, maybe, maybe I came from you. Maybe you are my leader. There's something, there's something about that where your dogs look like their owners, right? Yeah. Or owners look like their dogs. One of, one of the ways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm happy my nose isn't a foot long, but yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Taylor, thank you so much. This has been a fun conversation. I hope you've enjoyed it too. And, and hope our listeners enjoyed it too. There's a lot, a lot of good stuff uh, that we talked about, but before we let you go, any, uh, where can people follow you? Uh, plug in all the channels. Where can people find you? Yes. Sweet. Um, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok, T Averill 13. Uh, I'm constantly sharing like workout stuff, making volleyball fun, joking around. Like all of me is expressed through there, um, with videos and different things. Um, obviously say the podcast, we already talked about tallest podcast on earth, check it out if you want to. Um, and then, you know, I started middle blocker Academy, which is a way to give back specifically to middles. I'm also working with clubs now to help consult for their middles. I do one-on-one mentorship. I have just really reached a place in the last couple of years of it's not, I'm tired of it just being about me. My life's been about me. It's been about my success. It's been about me getting better at volleyball. Where am I going next year? How much money am I making? Where am I going to pull play? Um, so competitive it's just like it's it can lead you down a path of just like me 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 so i feel compelled in some way to find a chance to to give back so that's what i'm doing i enjoy it so much like the kids i work with like it's a blast it teaches me so much like i'm learning so much and i'm I'm a big believer in being a a lifelong learner so selfishly there are ways for me to learn a lot of different things um so i enjoy it too so it's kind of a a win-win-win hopefully for all those involved uh, but yeah, that's my stuff. I'm hoping uh, I'm putting it out there in the world now. I'm hoping to start a vlog. If things work out in China and we go there. Cool. I want to do a vlog in China because everyone's like, what? Volleyball in China? And me too. So I'm like, let's just record this so we can have that memory forever and share with people like what it's like. So mm-hmm. that's what I'm hoping to do. Fingers crossed. Yeah, cool. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I just love hearing your energy and passion about giving back. That's that's so awesome. But uh Thank you. Awesome conversation. Thank you. And, and good luck in your pro season. And then, yeah, looking forward to seeing you in the USA gym early next year. Yeah, right on, man. I appreciate you guys having me. All right. We'll talk soon. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Bye. I just realized we had two middle blockers back to back. Back to back. Back to back episodes. So that was awesome. Uh, but yeah, uh, Taylor, awesome conversation with Taylor. We could have talk to him for another couple hours probably uh, honestly yeah he's such a great guy to talk to uh such an easy guy to talk to too and and thank you so much to taylor for just being so open about his background especially going through college and you know getting kicked off of a couple college teams and but 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 such a cool you know full circle moment to earn his way back into college volleyball and then to play for the first coach that kicked him off the team uh john Sparrow. and you know their conversations since then have been great their relationship since then has been great but it, also funny when whenever he gets that call from john he, his heart drops <laughs> a little bit <laughs> he's like what did i do he goes through everything in, in his head he's like did i do something but um no awesome conversation with taylor um really looking forward to uh seeing the team as as they get back next year into the gym and you know kind of continue the preparations for Paris and seeing what that team's going to look like because you know what Taylor Taylor mentioned too that that squad is so deep um and so much experience coming back and some new young talent coming into the gym as well so it's going to be a lot of fun or it's going to be a fun team to watch uh as they you know prepare for Paris I agree I agree I mean um just just to reiterate what you said, um, the the amount of just effort and extra work and adding that on top of the, you know, mental pressure of just wanting to show that, you know, he changed and that he's working for this and that he will come back as a different person, like through, you know, through going through all that. I mean, it's 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 very it's very um, admirable for sure. I mean, you know, not a lot of people get, you know, a second and or, you know, a, a second and or a third chance when it comes to a lot of that. And, you know, he's just continuing to blow expectations out of the water. And, you know, he's he's one of, you know, my favorite middles to watch, um, you know, on the national team and 
on a personality as well too. Just very, it just, it just everything just clicks. Everything just clicks. You see the work there. Um, you see the low of the game there, and you know I think it's a uh, it's a great story. Like no matter what, um, you know, no matter what happens for Paris in twenty four. Uh, no matter what happens a couple years down the line, I think it is a very just incredible story, um, you know, that he gets to share um, with whoever would be willing to listen for sure. Yeah, you mentioned his love for the game too, and mm-hmm. just his efforts to give back to the sport too, and give back to young volleyball players and his mentorship, uh, everything with you know what he's trying to do with you won't too i thought his mm-hmm. you won't. uh explanation of that was so cool mm-hmm. and it, and it yeah it took me back to my high school days where we were competing with each other in the in the weight room and on the field uh you know just trying to better ourselves and it was just friendly competition and just a simple simple little phrase you won't uh is just inspiring that uh that next athlete that other athlete to you know, try to better themselves, you know, whether that's mentally or physically. Um, but yeah, so cool to hear what he's doing with that and hope he continues to grow that. And, um, as he, you know, focuses, uh, on his play on the court, but also what he's doing outside of the court as well. Yeah. But yeah, no, thank you again to Taylor. Uh, such an awesome conversation. I hope listeners, you enjoyed it. Uh, looking forward to having him back on the podcast too, because I feel like 100%. we, we had a lot more that we could have talked about. Um, but uh, yeah. If there was time, I wish I was in, you know, California. Oh, yes. And get yeah. an invite to train with a, <laughs> with a professional volleyball athlete. Man, he put insane. the message out there. So the if you're listening, out. you're living in that area, go go hit him up. Man, I've, oh, I've been, if I, if I was in California, right so now, cool. I'm like, all right, guys, I'm out. I'm going to go practice. That is so cool. Yeah. Let's we'll drop him out. <laughs> Yeah, if you're in that area, definitely, definitely reach out to Taylor and get some training in with him and you'll get a lot more out of it and he'll get a lot out of it too. He's really just looking to play some volleyball. So uh, yeah, so that, I thought that was funny and, and really cool uh, to, to hear that. But thank you so much, Taylor, for for taking the time to sit down with us and, and share your story and talk with us a little bit about your summer with USA and then you know looking forward to your hopes of, of making that Olympic team. And uh, we'll be rooting for you and good luck as you um, kind of navigate your way through your club season right now too. And then of course, we hope to see you back in the USA gym very soon. Oh yeah. Uh, I think it's about time. Uh, yeah. For <laughs> upcoming events. Coming <laughs> events with Steve. <laughs> A shorter list for, for me today, but today, November 15th, is the last day to register for the Mountain Classic Boys National Qualifier on December 1st through the 3rd in our backyard here in Denver, Colorado. I'll be there. Clarence, you'll be there. I'll also be there. Curtis will be there. Yep. Curtis will be there. there. Rob, everybody's going to be there. So you should show up and and, and and play some volleyball. Little volleyball (laughs) palooza. Little volley palooza. Just show up (laughs) unregistered. I I heard we should play volleyball here, guys. Just still going to... Yeah, Steven mentioned on the podcast you can we can just play volleyball. <laughs> We're gonna come to the desk stage. I'm gonna be like, um, um, yeah, we gotta um, uh, uh, <laughs> gotta open up a court, guys. Sorry, we need like a pickup division or something, or a, a walk up, a, a walk up team register. <laughs> like just ra- like individual athletes can walk up and play together. That'd be insane. That'd be kind of cool. Just like go from gym. Yeah. Uh, continuing on, also on November 24th, there will be an NTDP indoor accelerator in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, good luck to, uh, good luck and congratulations to all participants and shout out to the Aloha region for hosting that event. And More the, details. Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just going to say the US Volleyball Show is sponsoring that. So we'll be too. Oh, yes. In Honolulu, Hawaii, um, <laughs> and covering the event. That is not true, but we are trying. And <laughs> anyone's, just traveling, <laughs> anyone's traveling to that event, they got a few extra tickets, plane tickets. Just let me get you tickets. I yep. will try to fit in a large suitcase. Um, if you have one that can pick someone who is 6'2. Um, but yeah, <laughs> try to put it in the atmosphere, guys. Try to put it out there. That's right. More details on all upcoming events can be found at usavolleyball.org. All right. On to the pro side. You ready for this? <laughs> oh yeah. First up, we have the Beach Pro Tour Challenge uh, from November 16th 
through the 19th in Xi Ang Mai. Did I say that right? Xi Ang Mai, China. Up next after that, we have Beach Pro Tour Elite 16, November 22nd through the 26th in Joao Pessoa. 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 Yeah. Pessoa. Excuse me. Joao Pessoa, Brazil. After that, last but not least, we have the Beach Pro Tour Futures, uh, November 22nd through the 26th in Julong, Australia. Good luck to all our national team athletes competing in those events. Oh, man, those are some tough words to pronounce, man. Someone's going to email us and be like, it's G-Long, actually. It's G-Long. <laughs> <laughs> Lars, you're like, that's what Go guys. Google told me. That's what Google told me how to pronounce it. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> remember, listeners, you can rate and review, share with friends, family, teammates. It really helps this podcast grow and reach new listeners. And check out our video episodes now on our website and YouTube channel. We thank you for your continued support. Do you know a club that should be featured or a story you'd like us to share? You can email us at the USAB show at USAB.org. Leave us feedback and let us know about any future topics you'd want to hear about. New episodes drop every other week. And until next time, this is the USA Volleyball Show, the official podcast of USA Volleyball. This has been the USA Volleyball Show with Clarence Hughes and Stephen Munson. Produced by Curtis Ward. Our content producer is Lara Fawcett. Our marketing lead is Bree Jaycox. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to rate and review. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the USA Volleyball Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts.